Good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us online to worship together. We're so glad that you've chosen to spend this time with us. And we want to begin today by singing a song that reminds us of God's faithfulness, of his goodness. It says in Lamentations 3, Because of the Lord's faithful love, we do not perish, for his mercies never end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to the Lord, you are my portion, therefore I will put my hope in you. So we ask you to just join us and sing together wherever you are in your home or away. Hey, good morning. Welcome to Hope Chapel Online. I'm Pastor Steve, and thank you for tuning in today. In just a few moments, we're going to be taking the Lord's Supper communion, and you'll want to go ahead and grab some elements. You can go ahead and hit pause or just grab those if you have them already available. I'll be using some of our pre made packaging things, but whether you have some matzo bread or grape juice, or crackers and water or whatever it may be. There is some symbolism within the elements 
Uh, however, it's more about your heart and your relationship with God that matters. And we'll get into that in just a moment. So you can go ahead and, and grab those things. And uh, But I just want to let you know that if you are new or newer to Hope Chapel, we are so thrilled that you decided to check us out today. We'd really like to get to know you a little bit more. In order for us to do that, we need your information. And in order to do that, if you would go to our website, go to hopechapelsterling.org, and there is a connect card button. Just click on that, fill out the form with your information, and we'll be able to reach out to you and just touch base, learn a little bit more about you, and answer any questions you have about Hope Chapel or your next steps with God. Now, as many of you know, we are having a single service on Sundays at 9 a.m. outdoors here on our property. We'd welcome anyone to come out and to physically distance and to wear a mask, but to worship and fellowship with us together, weather permitting, through August, through Labor Day, and we may be ha perhaps be doing it um, through September as much as possible because of the good weather. But we'll see. We'll see what happens. Uh, also in September, look forward to having our Kids Connect open. And a lot of details on there. We're still working with leaders. If, In fact, if you would like to volunteer in that aspect, you can reach out to our staff and you can just put that in a Connect card too. And uh, as always, go to our website, hopechapelsterling.org. Click on the Connect card, prayer card, and share your prayer needs with us. We would love to pray with you and for you. And you'll also find links on our websites to... Uh, groups that are continuing to go on, life groups. We'll be starting those back up in September, as well as uh, launch. Our young adult groups are continuing. They have continued throughout this time, and you're going to want to connect with that if you are a young adult. Well, uh, now as we enter into time of Lord's Supper communion, uh, the reason that we partake of it is to remember what Jesus Christ had done for us on the cross. Uh, the Apostle Paul writes about how the church is to use this as a time to remember what God has done until he returns. You can find it in the Gospels as Jesus is conducting the ordinance with his disciples. Matthew 26, starting in verse 26, is a great passage in the Gospels. But I want to look at what Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and he says starting in verse 23 for i received from the lord what i also passed on to you on the night when he was betrayed the lord took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me in the same way he also took the cup after supper said this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for if often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, the Apostle Paul was writing to this church who had quite a bit of division, and he was trying to unify them together uh, to dismiss opinions and preferences they may have. He understood that there was a need to have some differences of doctrines, and so that the true doctrine uh, would take precedent over people who were trying to teach false doctrine and heresies. And so there needed to be some divisions and understandings and discussions about the truth. But some things just uh, didn't need to happen. They were opinions and preferences. And we can understand that within the church today, there is plenty of opinions and preferences that maybe needs to skirt off to the side, especially as we focus on what Jesus Christ had done for us. In fact, Paul was really getting on to this church for taking the Lord's Supper improperly in an unworthy way. They had really uh, not been a unified church. There were some divisions for unnecessary things. And so also in this passage, Paul encourages them to examine themselves, to make sure that they aren't partaking of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy fashion. And I'm going to give us about 30 seconds for you to spend time personally with God, asking God whether there are some things that you're holding with inside of you, maybe against another church member or within church leadership or the church, 
and and maybe it's rightfully so and maybe you need to reach out and and deal with that with them on one on one or maybe it's something you're holding on to and as last week we learned talk about forgiveness something that you just maybe need to let go whatever it may be maybe there's some other sins going on in your life that you need to confess and repent of before God before you partake of his uh, remembrance of his body and blood that was shed for us so Let me just take a few moments, and you could take a few moments just to spend time with God and asking Him to reveal those things that you need to examine and take care of. Let's spend some time. Lord Jesus, as we partake of a symbol of a remembrance of what you did on the cross for us is how you died for our sins, how your blood was shed for our sins to offer us forgiveness of sins so that our relationship with you can be restored. Thank you for what you have done, offering us grace and mercy and love. And God, if there is anyone who does not have a personal relationship with you, who has not accepted your gift of salvation. God, we know that the the opportunity is laid before them, that you freely offer it to anyone. If they acknowledge their sin before you, believe that you are God's Son who was sent to die on the cross for the forgiveness of sins, confess their sins to you, you will forgive them of their sins. So if there's anyone out there hearing this this morning, who has not done so, I pray that they would do so, and they can do so. If they have any questions, they could reach out to me or to one of the people here at the church. It's in your son Jesus' name that we can and do pray. Amen. So we're partaking of our elements. If you have your cracker, I invite you to take that. And just as Paul said, and Jesus said, that this is his body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of him. And now you can get your juice, your drink ready. And just as Jesus says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. What we have done as God has commanded me, he bless you during this week. Amen. Before there was light Walked across the pages of time He who made every living thing Behold Him He who heard humanity's cry Left His throne to wake as a child He who came like the leaves of us Behold him, Jesus, Son of God, Messiah, the Lamb of all desire. Oh, be still and behold him. Behold him. and saints, heal the blind, the lost, and the lame. Even now he is in our midst. Behold him, he who chose a criminal
is the Lord God Almighty, worthy, worthy, worthy to receive all praise. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, worthy, worthy. Hey there, I'm Neil Davidson, lead pastor here at Hope Chapel, and it's my privilege today to bring you a message for our service on August the 16th, 2020. If I've not had the chance to meet you yet, I look forward to being able to do that in the near future. Just a reminder, we are doing on-campus worship, but outdoors here for the month of August and probably into September as well. Just stay tuned to all of that, but it's, it's great to have you be a part of our service for today, the 16th of August. You know, um, I want to talk to us today, uh, I think, about a really critical message. I, I, you know, I, I'm, I have a great deal of passion and urgency about this. I'm really energized by our message because I think the time that we're living in right now has actually made one of our greatest challenges even harder. I think we're living in a time that one of our greatest challenges has actually become even more challenging. And the reason I say that and what I'm talking about is, is the use of our words, our tongues. You know, the book of James, which is over at the end of your New Testament, and, and I'm just going to refer there a couple times. We're really going to be spending our time today in the book of Proverbs. But in James chapter 3, verse 6, this is what the scripture says. It says, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is a fire. The, the tongue, a, a world of unrighteousness. In other words, it has this life of its own. It's placed among our bodies, uh, among our members. It stains the whole body, sets the course of life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. And if you look at that whole passage in chap James chapter 3, it's talking about the tremendous challenge that we have as the people of God who have the presence of God living within us through the person of the Holy Spirit, through our relationship with Jesus Christ, the challenge that we have in controlling our tongues. And I believe that actually that challenge has gotten harder for us in the days in which we're living. And the reason I say that, one, is that I really think our, our national discourse, just the whole tone of our conversation in, in, uh, in, in the culture that we're a part of, has actually just gotten more caustic, more abrasive, uh, more, you know, more toxic kind of thing. And so it's just easy for us to slip into that language of just being aggressive and, 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 and negative and attacking and critical with our words. And then on top of that, you take this whole 
virus scenario that we're in with all the lockdown that's gone on. And so you mix all this anxiety up with frustration and you mixed in with the negativity and the toxic mix that we have. And it just makes this whole challenge of controlling our tongues all that much harder because all the stimuli around us is encouraging us just to unleash that fire that's within us and just really to set, set the forest on fire of our lives. And, and yet God has a word for us about not doing that. And so I've been in this series this summer called One Hit Wonders, and I've been going back into sermon series that we've done here at, at Hope Chapel over the last five or six years and pulling out messages that we really need to hear again. And the whole premises of our series has been that sometimes we need to hear something more than once before we really get it. So we need to hear from God a second time about these same things. Again, let me say that again. Sometimes we need to hear something more than once before we actually get it. And I think that's particularly true with the subject matter that we're talking about today, which is the way that we use our words, right? And there's a, there's a challenge for us to, to constantly be vigilant. We need to hear over and over again about being careful with the use of our words. So I've actually tapped back into a series that we did a few summers ago out of the book of Proverbs and talking about timeless wisdom for us today. You know, it's timeless wisdom for modern living. And we're going to be looking today at the book of Proverbs. And somebody said, boy, I want to write down some of these references. Really, you can just write down the whole book of Proverbs because there's over 125 different verses in the book of Proverbs that deal with the issue of how we use our words, right? And what comes out of our mouths and, and the tone of our speech and all that kind of stuff. And, and so I'm going to spend 10 minutes on every single one of those. No, 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 I'm only kidding. We're, not going to, we're going to have to pick and choose, but there's some great truths for us to be reminded of today. So let me toss out a theme verse for us today to look at from the book of Proverbs. So if you're looking for the book of Proverbs, it's relatively easy, even if you don't know kind of where things are in your Bible. You can always use a table of conference at the front, but the book of Proverbs is right after the book of Psalms. So Psalms is generally right in the middle of your Bible. It's the biggest book that we have in the Bible. If you can get to Psalms, just keep turning to the right, and eventually you're going to come to Proverbs, and I'm going to be jumping all over the book of Proverbs today, so you might want to keep your, your Bibles open and your fingers stuck in there. But, but here's our theme verse for today. It comes from Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. So if we love life, the life that's in our word, we're going to eat the fruit of that. If we love the death that's in our word, the hardship, the, 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 the separation, the, the conflict that can create, that's the fruit that we're going to eat. And so the whole tone of the book of Proverbs is, is appealing to us to be people who live with wisdom, to live with godly wisdom. You know, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. And so it's really challenging us to be people who live in the fear of the Lord. That means we listen to what he's saying to us, and out of that we live with wisdom. So let's talk first of all. I, what I want to do is I want to create a sense of urgency, a priority, if you will, for why we really need to be conscious of the way that we use our words, that we need to be diligent with the way that we speak. Again, this challenge has gotten all that much harder for us. So what is it that you and I need to make sure we understand and we build our lives around so that we actually are motivated to be careful about the way that we use our words, the way we let our tongues flap away in our mouths? And so here, here are three things I really think the wise understand. If you and I are going to be wise people, there are th at least three things related to our words that speak to us and we are always conscious of and they govern the way we live. And here's the first one, that we understand that what we say matters. Let me say that again. We understand that what we say matters. 
I think sometimes we think, well, they're just words, right? They're just words, you know? You know, um, you know, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, right? Actually, that's not true. Words really do matter. They really do hurt. And, and I just read that for us, right? From Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21. Life and death are in words because words really matter, right? They, they have an impact. They change things. You know, it's interesting that many people will look back through history and they will look at Winston Churchill, who served as the prime minister of England during World War II, and they will say that he willed the nation to victory by the use of his words. In fact, President John F. Kennedy once said that, that Churchill was a guy who, 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 um, who turned words into weapons, right? He sent the words into battle. And by his words, he energized the willpower of the English people to hold on until the world could get there and help them achieve victory. Words matter. They have an impact. First of all, just a few ideas to kind of bring that to life, right? And some of this comes right out of the book of, of, of uh, Proverbs. First of all, you know, the way we use our words literally affects the tone of our lives. The, the way we use our words, the, the, the spirit of our speech, actually affects the culture, if you will, of our relationships, right? And Look at, look at um, if you want to do, look at Proverbs chapter 18, verse 6. So we've been looking at verse 21. Just back up a little bit if you want to. It says, it says a fool's lips lead to strife, and his mouth provokes a beating, right? So if you and I are critical people, if we're judgmental people, if we're always attacking and demeaning and tearing down and ridiculing other people, guess what? That's what we're going to reap. Because the, our words shape the tone of our lives. If you're, if you're, if you think you're in, in your relationship circle, whether you're it's your family or your neighborhood or where you work, you're, you're the constant focus of criticism, etc. Just look at your own words. You're probably inviting that stuff, right? A, 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 a few weeks ago, I stayed up really late at night and I and I just watched My Fair Lady again. It was on, it was on, I think Turner Classic Movies or whatever it was, and it was in. in, in and Henry Higgins came to mind when I thought about this, this main star, right? He was always just jabbing and criticizing, whatever. And that's what he got back from everybody because the tone of his words, the nature of his words, influenced the relationships that he had with all the people who were around him. I think you see that unfolding in our, in our political world. You know, President, President Trump, when he was a candidate, was somebody who, was, who would sling ridicule and derogatory comments and name-calling and etc., and, and now that's really become, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way of conversation that both sides of the aisle have eagerly adopted. And in some ways, what we get is what's been invited because it's the tone of our words. And so if you and I are people who are, who are fools and we, we're, we're going to invite, if you will, that beating, we're going we're gonna to invite that stress or strife into our lives, but it also works the other way. It can also invite peacefulness. Proverbs 21, verse 23 says, The one who guards his mouth and his tongue keeps himself out of trouble. <laughs> so when, when we guard our mouths and we're protective of what we say, and what we say is inducive to life, we keep ourselves out of trouble. We invite peace into our lives. Our words matter because they shape the tone of, of all of our relationships in our lives. And if we're going to be abrasive and confrontive and all that kind of stuff, that's what we're going to get back. And if we're going to be supportive and encouraging and loving and hopeful, that's what we're going to get back. Because our words invite the tone of our lives. You know, I think we also understand that our words matter because our words really do either help or hurt other people. Our words help or hurt other people. They have an impact on other people. Many of us who are, who are hearing this message today could, could back up and play some tape in our lives and we can remember things that are said to us that just lifted us up and carried us and we can remember things that were said to us that just 
crush us, right? We, we, we fall, because our words matter, right? So if you want a, a verse, and I'm going to come back to this a little later in a different setting, but, but Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18, it says, one who speaks rashly like a piercing sword. Our words can be like a piercing sword. They can bring injury to people. But the tongue of the wise brings healing. Our words impact others, and because of that, they matter. They matter. They're not just words. They also affect our relationship with God. Believe it or not, our words affect our relationship with God because we can use our words in a way that's righteous or edifying that builds us up in our relationship with God, or we can use our words in a way that are sinful and separate ourselves away from God. And, and, and I'm just going to read a few verses to you, and you might want to make a note here. This is from Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19. Real, real quick, Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. The Lord hates six things. In fact, seven are detestable to him. And here are the six things. Arrogant eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that plots wicked schemes, feet eager to run to evil, a lying witness who gives false testimony, and one who stirs up trouble among brothers. Now the thing I want you to note out of that verse is that three of those things are related to the way we use our mouths, the way we use our words. And so the way we speak can either be egregious to God or they can be joyous to God, and that affects our relationship with him. So our words matter. Wise people understand that our words matter. They also understand that they are the ones who are responsible for their words. You know, I think we live in, 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 in an age where we just want to blame everybody else for our own behaviors. Well, if they hadn't done this, I wouldn't have done that, so it's not my fault. And if they hadn't said this, then I wouldn't have said what I followed up with. And so we want to blame other people. Wise people understand that they are the ones who are responsible for what they say and what they do, right? And and this is really challenging for us because of the sheer volume of words that we use on a regular basis. You know, I, I did a little bit of research in, in, in preparation for the message when I preached it in the, in the Proverbs series a few years ago and again for today. They say that the average person in a lifetime will speak over 850 million words. 850 million words. Now, I didn't do the math for myself, but one of the things I read was that if you treated every word as just one inch, that means every single one of us speaks enough words to get us all the way to Los Angeles, back to Boston, and then all the way down to Key West in a lifetime. That's a lot of words, right? It's a lot of words. In fact, that means we speak more than a million words a year. And, and Somewhere again in the research, it was like, there's a million feet between Boston and New York City. So that means every single year, we speak enough words to get there one foot at a time from here to New York City. That's, a ton, that's over 2,700 words a day. So the sheer volume of them has a tendency just to kind of lessen our sense of responsibility for what we say, because we're just using them all the time. But wise people understand, right? Wise people understand that they're really responsible for their own words. In fact, Proverbs chapter 4, right? And, and these, this is like the plea of a father to his son. I believe it's the plea of our heavenly father to us as children. In Proverbs chapter 4, verses 20 through 22, just, just listen to this. It says, it says, my son, pay attention to my words. Listen closely to my sayings, right? Don't lose sight of them. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. Guard your heart above everything else, 
for it's a source of life. Don't let your mouth speak dishonestly, right? He's including our speech and his wisdom, his plea for him to lead, live wisely. And don't let your lips talk deceive, de- deviously. Let your eyes look forward. Fix your gaze straight ahead. Carefully consider the path that are on your feet. Be careful the way that you're using your words. Accept responsibility for how you're using your words. And all your ways will be established. Don't turn to the right or to the left. Keep your feet away from evil. Again, that's Proverbs chapter 4, verses 20 through 27. You know, I could actually just go through this whole message and do nothing but just read verses to you from the book of Proverbs, and it would be powerful. But wise people accept the fact that they are responsible for their own words. And when we release control of what we say to somebody else, we're in big trouble and pain is coming into our lives. And third thing, wise people not only understand that their words matter and that they're responsible for the words that they use, they also realize that their words are a reflection of who they really are. Their words are a reflection of who they really are. You know, we, we, we go to the, you know, we go in, I'm scheduled in a little over a month to go in for, our, or probably this year, I have a virtual kind of uh, uh, annual physical. And they take your temperature and they take your blood pressure. And the reason they do that is they're trying to figure out how you're doing. So how do we figure out how we're doing with our character? You know what Jesus says? Just pay attention to what you say. Just listen to what's coming out of your mouth. It will tell you what's in your heart. Well, look at, um, again, um, if, uh, uh, James chapter 3, verse 2. It says, if anyone doesn't stumble... And what he says, he's mature. Right? So we, if we want to see if we are mature, if we've achieved a certain level of spiritual development, strength of faith, Christian character, Christ-likeness, just look at what you're saying. Because if we can control our words, we don't stumble in what we say, then we're mature. And we're able to control our whole body. That's James chapter 3, verse 2. And, and then Jesus says in, in Luke chapter 6, verse 45, a good person produces good out of the good stored up in their heart. And an evil person produces evil out of the evil stored in his heart. And listen, this is the phrase I really want you to dwell on. For his mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. And this is not just limited to Luke. There's other references to this in the other Gospels. Jesus says, you want to know what's in your heart? You want to know who you really are? Just listen to what you hear coming out of your mouth. That's going to tell you what's in there, right? That's what's going to tell you. It's going to tell you whether you're mature or immature. He's going to tell you if you're full of love or of hate, if you're merciful or if you're judgmental, if you're full of truth or you're full of lies, whether you're godly, whether you're worldly, it's going to come out of your mouth. Just listen to what you're saying and it'll tell you who you are. You'll be able to see who you are out of what you say. And the wise person listens to what they're saying and says, you know what, I need to grow. I need to change. I need to repent. I need to be more godly. And they learn from what they learn about themselves from what they say. So the wise people understand that their words matter, right? That they're responsible for what they say, and what they say reflects who they are, and with that it shows them where they need to grow. And I'm hoping all of those things just make us have a sense of urgency, a sense of commitment in the, in the, in the overwhelming sense of responsibilities and everything we got going on or whatever. Sometimes our words can just pop and say, yeah, it's just what it is. And especially since we're speaking 2,800 of them a day, right? And I, I think we really need to have a sense of urgency as people who seek to be wise in God's eyes, to pay attention and to change the way that we speak. So let me give you some suggested skill sets to go with that sense of urgency. What are some habits that are helpful for you and I to develop or to understand if we're going to be people who use our words skillfully in being wise before God as a true reflection of what's going on inside of our hearts? And so there's several things I I want to give you here. And again, these are all going to come out of the book of Proverbs for the most part. And, and the very first one is, 
is, I think, is just critical, especially when things start to get a little energized in our lives. And the first one is you need to pause before you actually pronounce. Let me say that again. You need to pause before you pronounce. You know, there's a passage of Scripture in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 32. It says, patience is better than power. Right? Having self-control is more important than having overwhelming force, if you will. Patience is better than power, and controlling one's emotions, self-control, is better than capturing a city. You know that actually being in control of ourselves is a greater victory than victory over others. Now, that's, that's, that's a big word. And, 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 and this idea of patience, of self-control, of, of, of being able to, what he's really hinting is that when you and I are patient, when we're masters of our, over who we are rather than just what we do, it allows us to act as well as to speak in a way that's consistent with the character and the values we want to have in our lives. If you want to be Christ-like in what you say, you have to be able to control what you say so that you can act in accordance with what you really value, in accordance with who you really want to be. And that takes time to kind of slow down and pause before you pronounce, right? Hey, let me just, another verse, and then I'll share a personal uh, application or story for me. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 11. I know I'm throwing a lot of references at you. That's why I said, just write down Proverbs and go read the whole thing. But chapter 19, verse 11 says this, a person's insight gives him patience. Now, you don't have insight unless you stop and think about it. You've got to pause. And his virtue is to overlook an offense. And that act of overlooking takes time. You're going to say, you know what, I can look, but I'm going to look this way, right? I'm, I'm going to overlook it. it. It takes a choice in the moment. You have to pause, decide what you want to do, and then do it. And, and, and learning to pause before we start speaking, before we start pronouncing, is a powerful thing. You know, um, I will tell you, one of the, I think one of the greatest gifts that God gave to Christina and, our, and I in our relationship is that in the few moments that we've actually gotten into heated arguments, our speech speed goes down. Uh, you know, and, and I, I can get energized for sure, and you're seeing that probably. I'm probably drinking too much coffee, got way too much caffeine flowing through me this morning and, and getting it out to you. But I got I to tell you, when, when we get into a situation where I know things that are energized, that we could be headed for a cliff, there's just something that kicks in that makes me speak more slowly, take longer to think about what I'm going to say in response to what she said, all those kinds of things. We pause, we slow down. Now listen, I wish that meant that I'd never said anything stupid, and that's not true because I've said some stupid stuff, but I got to tell you, if I didn't pause, if I didn't slow down, I would have said a lot more stupid stuff, and, and who knows, our relationship might have been paying the price for that, but sometimes when we, we'll, we'll just back up and slow down and think about what we're saying. Before we say it, it can have a huge impact in the communication that's going on in the relationships that matter most to us, even as we're sharing our faith with other people. Some of the best advice that I give to young couples as they're thinking about getting married and things is just say, you know what, when you get into an argument, slow down. Think before you speak. When you think about something, hit the pause button, play it a couple of times, think about how that's going to sound a week from now, change it as you need to, and then hit the play button and say it. Because you just need to pause so that we can be people who act, not according to our emotions, but according to our character. Here's another way. What we want to be doing with our speech, we want to be acting. We want, don't want to be just reacting. right? And you can't act unless you pause and think about it. We just react without thinking, and you can't do that and be the wise person that you need to be. You need to pause before you pronounce. Here's a second thing, and this really kind of relates a little bit to the first one. It said, you just need to be simply careful about how much you talk. 
And some of you are thinking, boy, my spouse hardly talks to me now. Don't be saying that. I want him to talk more, right? You know, but, but in other ways, listen, we just need to be careful about the sheer volume of what we say. Now, so, you know, pastor, you're just making that up. No, 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 no. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 19, right? And, and some, are, some spouses go, I'm going to memorize that and bring that up to my, my spouse the next time they, they want to talk a ton. It says, it says, when there are many words, sin is unavoidable. Proverbs chapter 10, 19, right? When there are many words, sin is unavoidable. But the one who controls his lips is prudent. Right? The one who controls his lips. Well, why is that true? Why is it that when, when there's lots of words, they're just flowing like a rush, like the, you know, the, 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 um, you know, the um, Niagara Falls just falling off? Why is it, is it, is it such a problem? I, I think it gives you, I think there's several different things I'd say related to that. Why, why does God give us this advice? How can you can see it in, in practical, real terms in our what, what, um, words. And, and the flip side of this, and I love this verse in, in Psalm, uh, the Proverbs chapter 17, verse 28. You know, if there's sin, if there's unavoidable sin in lots of words, sometimes we look smarter than we actually are just by keeping our mouths shut, right? Even a fool is considered wise when he keeps silent, right? Some of us will look a lot smarter if we just don't talk so much. But why is that? Let me give you, I think, just four quick little reasons. One, when we talk a lot, it's harder for the Holy Spirit to filter what we say. When, when we're just trying to pour so much through the Holy filter, Holy Spirit filter that's in our lives, it, it just overwhelms it. You know, um, Christina and I have this, this old hot tub that I've been trying to keep together with, with duct tape and et cetera for years and years. It's like 25 years old. And, and, and when you periodically have to refill it. And, and I could just take the garden hose and just stick it in there, and it would fill up probably in about an hour. But I put this filter on the end that takes a lot of metals and other kinds of stuff out that makes it difficult to keep the, the water looking good and, be, and being good and the chemicals in balance and stuff. But I will tell you, it takes three and a half to four hours to fill the thing. It just kind of slowly comes out in the far end. But the more water you push through it, the less filtering you get. And the same principle applies. When we just are, are, are just filling our guts all the time without restraint, right? The Holy Spirit has a hard time guarding what we're saying and, 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 and giving us that wisdom. Secondly, just talking all the time can, can cause us to obsess about certain things. We just, we just look in at it, and that's all we can talk about. It's all we can think about, and we just blow it out of proportion. And when we blow things out of proportion, for the most part, we're, we're going to start acting and speaking unwisely. Because we can access with it. I think sometimes we talk a lot because we're, we're just enamored with our own opinion. And when we're enamored with our own opinion, we're not listening to other people's opinions. And we're by definition getting dumber instead of smarter, right? Because all we're getting is our own perspective. And so sometimes when we're talking a lot, it, 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 we're just enamored with our own opinion. And we don't, we're not giving any airtime for anybody else to speak into our lives with the good stuff that they can be speaking into our lives. And, and the last thing I, I, I think is, is one of the reasons why God offers us this advice is that there, there is something about the endless life of words. Things that we say just seems to hang in the air and just keep circling and eventually they boom around and ring and come back to us. You know, I, I give an example. You know, I used to do some denominational work beforehand and, and before I uh, started pastoring here and, and launching Hope Chapel. And one of my responsibilities was to help equip churches to look for a new pastor when they needed a new pastor. And one of the things I constantly stressed with search committees, those who were charged with praying through and evaluating and then bringing a recommendation of who God is calling to be their next pastor, one of the things I said, you need to be confident. Uh, confidentiality. You need to have great confidentiality. And, and, you know, and sometimes, you know, you're dealing with a small church in a small village in upstate New England somewhere or whatever. And like, yeah, you know, if we talking about it, it's never going to get out. Right. And, and you'd be surprised. You know, you, you tell somebody that that's in the ch outside of the church or whatever, or s somebody else in the church and they mention it and say, oh yeah, our, our search committee is talking to some guy from XYZville, Alabama or something. And, and next thing you know, they, they, oh, I know somebody lives in that town and say, hey, you know what, our church is looking at the, next thing you know, it's, the, the, it's that pastor that you guys are talking to, right? And, 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 and all of a sudden now his, his ministry where he's at is jeopardized because of that. The, our words just have a way of just kind of living on 
And therefore, the less stuff we put out there to come back to haunt us, there's a lot of wisdom in that. You just need to be careful about how much you say. Sometimes less really is more, and that's even true in our communication. Here's another one, right? All right, so for, we need to pause before we pronounce. We need to make sure that we are careful with the volume of our words and that we're not just he- speaking to hear ourselves speak. But we also really need to know, wh- why am I saying this in the first place? Now, listen, I know that, that doesn't really apply to, all right, we're talking about the weather or, you know, what are we going to have for lunch or whatever. That kind of, I, I, I get that. But there's a lot of parts of our conversation that are far more significant than that. And we need to be really careful about sharing information that we're not sharing with the right motives. And, and, and because that can be really we, we need to ask ourselves the question, why am I saying this? Why do I feel a need to communicate this to this person, whoever you're talking to? But again, I mentioned this verse before, uh, chapter 12, verse 18. There is one who speaks rashly like a piercing sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Are you really trying to heal or are you trying to injure? Are you trying to heal or are you trying to hinder? And we could go through lots and lots of passages in in the book of Proverbs. Like I said, there's, there's over 125 different verses that speak to our use of words. But let me just point out a couple of things. You know, when we think about why we're saying what we're saying. What's our motivation behind it? Are we really trying to help? Are we trying to solve? Are we trying to contribute? Are we trying to edify? Or are we just looking to pass on and be a part of that kind of thing? Or are we trying to tear down or to injure? Or are we looking to correct and to build up? You know, listen to these verses about gossip. I I think a lot of the times the stuff that we pass on, stories that we tell about people around us, we're just doing it. And and, and, and in many ways, we're just just gossiping, passing on stuff, right? And it's stuff that doesn't need to be shared, but hey, it's a good story, right? It's funny or it's embarrassing, you know, that kind of stuff. Just, Just listen to these verses, right? Chapter 11, verse 13. Gossip reveals secrets. But the trustworthy keeps confidences. Chapter 20, verse 19. It says, avoid someone with a big mouth. <laughs> when, 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 when it says, be careful when you're around people who just repeat everything that they've heard. Be careful and don't become like them. Chapter 17, verse 9. Whoever conceals an offense promotes love. Right? I've learned something embarrassing about somebody else. They made a mistake or whatever. And boy, that could be great conversation over this breakfast or this lunch or on this phone call or whatever. But you know what? Whoever conceals an offense promotes love, but whoever gossip separates friends. Powerful stuff. You know, one of the things I tell our leadership here all the time is that if we really want people to open up their hearts so that we can speak grace and truth into their lives when they're in very difficult moments. One of the very, one of the, one of the critical things we have to do is to be people who can be trusted with confidences. You know, because people could say, oh, you know, they could come to me or a staff member or an elder and say, boy, I'm really struggling with X, Y, and Z. And, and, and I could be sitting in a meeting or visiting with, or with my life group or whatever and say, oh, I'd really like for you to pray for X, Y, Z, you know, this person who's struggling with X, Y, Z. And I can couch it in the spirit of prayer, but the next thing you know, there's 10 people asking them, oh, how are you doing with that? And they're like, what, does, you know, does everybody know my business? And the next time they have an issue, they're not going to bring it up again. We need to be very careful as to why we're saying what we say. Why do I need to pass this on? Is this person a part of the solution or is it just something that fills the airtime? Gossip. Flattery is another one of those, right? You know, a man who flatters his neighbor is spreading a net for his feet. He's trying to entrap him. <laughs> you know, the illustration I use, and maybe this is a great time of year for it. It's going to be like 90 degrees out today, is that, you know, we, 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 we always want to buddy up to the people who have pools when it's hot out. 
right? We, we want to flatter them just a little bit. Maybe we'll get an invite. I, I, you know, we did this all the time as, as a kid. We only had two or three people in our neighborhood who had pools. And boy, I tell you what, when it was going to be really hot, those are the kids you'd call and say, hey, you want to hang out today? Because you wanted to get invited to go swimming in the pool kind of idea. And sometimes we just need to be careful. Well, why am I doing this? Am I, am I trying to manipulate this person or whatever? Flattery kind of idea. Here's one. I'm just going to give you a general mantra because I got to wrap up here pretty quickly. Proverbs chapter 26, verse 20. This would be a great verse for you to memorize. Proverbs chapter 26, verse 20. It says, without wood, a fire goes out. Without gossip, conflict dies out. Wow, right? If we don't keep throwing the wood of words on the fire, eventually the conflict's going to die. We need to be careful about why we're saying what we're saying. And make sure we're doing it for reasons that are really godly. I got, I got one last point I want to make, right? So it's, it's pausing, right? And, and, it, and it's um, being careful about why we're saying what we're saying. And, and be careful about how much we are saying. And here's the last point. Realize that when you say something can be just as important, if not more important, than what you say. When you say something can actually be more important than what you actually say, right? A couple of verses. Proverbs 25, verse 11. I know you're writing down all kinds. A word spoken at the right time is like gold apples in silver settings. Wow, <laughs> right? A word spoken at the right time is like gold apples in silver settings, right? Well, so let me give you an example. I told you so, right? So if, if we offer that word before they crash, it's a good word. If we offer it afterwards, eh, probably not so great, right? Like, you know, like you say to somebody, hey, wa watch your step. Did you say it before they actually tripped and fell? Or did you just say it after they tripped and fell, right? Same with it, like, you know, watch your head, right? You know, you got a low-hanging beam. Watch your head. Did you say it before they got there and bang their forehead on it? Or did you say it after they already did that. It makes all the difference when you say something, not just what you say. Another reference, Proverbs chapter 15, verse 23. A person takes joy in giving an answer. And a timely word, <laughs> how good is it, right? It's a timely word, how good is it, right? It, it's, it's powerful stuff. I, I got to tell you, you know, um, when we say something, can be just as important, if not more important, than what we say. Because we can say the right thing, but we say it at the wrong time, and it can have the right, it can have the opposite impact of what we want to have. And if somebody is struggling after, because they've just banged their head on the beam, you know, it, as an illustration, and you're saying, hey, watch your head, they, they, boy, that can just set them off, rather than giving them a moment to be able to recover and go forward. So I'm going to give you an example. This one comes out of, of my background. Many of you know that Christina and I were high school sweethearts. And so, and, and to tell you the truth, I don't know exactly the time frames that this, took, this event took place, but I remember the details exactly of it. And I think it was right after she graduated from high school and had committed to going to the same college that I was attending. And so at that point in time, it really looked like the relationship was going to continue forward. And, and I remember we were out one evening, and, and her family lived on the Marlboro Sudbury line. And so on our way home from dinner one night, we stopped at the grist mill in, in, in Sudbury, and we were parked there in my, in my mom's car. She had a Grand Prix, and we had a moonroof open, and the winds was down, windows were down. It was a beautiful evening and all that kind of stuff. And so we're sitting in front of this, and there's lots of people around us, right? So we weren't there by ourselves, kind of, whatever. There's lots of people in other cars around us looking at this gorgeous kind of like a postcard kind of scene. And, and, and the statement I made to her was, hey, you want to get married someday? Now, that's not really one of the best proposals that's ever been offered in and romantic history, right? I mean, it was it's pretty lame, right? You want to get married someday. But I got to tell you, because, you know, and I, and I didn't have a lot of bait on my hook, you know, to bring in a, a fish quite as big as, as Christina. But I got to tell you, when I offered it in that setting, it made all the difference in the world, right? And she said yes. We, it was a few years later before we got formally engaged and, and actually set up our wedding plans and those kinds of things. But really, it's that point that we did, and it was the when, not the what or how I did it, right? It was the when I did it, because the 
the, the setting was just idyllic, right? It was just beautiful, and, and that kind of idea. I got to tell you, when we offer something can be just as critical as what we say to people. So there's a lot here to think over, right? I don't even know how long I've been talking yet. It, 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 there's a lot here for us to think over. But here, here's my question really to you today is, what are your words telling you? What are your words telling you? You know, realize we're, we're, in, a, we're in a tough time for the way we use our words. It's really easy to feel all the peer pressure of the toxic, aggressive, biting kind of nature around us. And we already have all these internal struggles of not letting our emotions drive what we say rather than our faith driving what we say. And we put all of that together. It can be really a hard time for us. And my challenge to you, my challenge to myself is just to back up, slow down enough and say, what are my words telling me about what's going on in my heart? What are, what are your words telling you about what's going on in your heart? And if those words are words of desperation and of fear and of anxiousness, of hopelessness, I hope you'll listen to those words and you'll find the answer to them in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ who came into our world to give his life for us so that we can have a relationship with him that lasts forever. You know, it's just simply really a process of admitting that we need a Savior and believing that Jesus is that Savior and then committing to following him in faith. doesn't mean you know everything that you need to do, but it means you are committed to learning and following after him in the spirit of faith. What's your heart? What, what, what are your words telling you about what's going on in your heart? And I pray that through the fear of the Lord, all of us will come to be people who are living with wisdom. Let me pray. God, thanks for the privilege of being in your word today. You know, in many ways, it, today was like drinking from a fire hose. Boy, the, we, could, we could stop in every single point and have a long discussion about the way we use our words. But it's just the kind of thing that you love to do, Father, to, to, to bring your Holy Spirit alongside us and in us and keep that conversation going. God, let us be people who flourish in our relationship with you and flourish in our relationship with other people and flourish as the light of the world because of the way we use our words. Father, let our words show us what's in our heart and experience your grace and healing as a part of that. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, thanks for being with us today. I hope that you'll have a great week. And if there's any way that we can serve you, please reach out and contact us. You can just, just go to our website and there's a way for you to share a need with us. You can also give if you'd like to in this moment. But we want it to be more than just words on the screen. We want to be a part of God's living word present in your life. So reach out to us. God bless. Have a great week.